So now that we've got our technical information out of the way, and before we begin this event, I'd like to turn it over to Lauren Croyce, who's the faculty director at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and associate professor in the history of art department at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, thank you so much for being here, Lauren. Thank you, Katie. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us today. Before we begin this event, we take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chotenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Moekma Ohlone people and other fam familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the UC Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Here at the Hearst, we're working to recognize and grapple with our own specific origins and roles within the university. Even before we existed as a museum, our collections began with projects that participated in and were made possible by campaigns of genocide waged against native Californian people, ancestors whose descendants are still here alive with us today. As a museum, we want to acknowledge the pain our institution has caused and work to offer a meaningful apology. We aim to create new kinds of collaborative relationships in the present and the future, which will affirm indigenous sovereignty and hold ourselves accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. We wanna offer an apology by transforming the museum into a site for justice, inclusion, and anti-racist action and affirm indigenous knowledge production. We thank you all for being here and welcome those just arriving. I'd like to share with you a bit about how this program came into being. Earlier this year, we opened an exhibit at the Hearst, actually in person, entitled Cloth That Stretches, Weaving Community Across Time and Space. It's now viewable online. That exhibit explores textiles and fabrics as site for identity formation, cultural resilience, and resistance. And I've also had the pleasure of working with Beth Piatot on various projects, both in and beyond the Hearst Museum. Last spring, we taught, beginning in person, a course called From Democracy to Decolonization, The History and Future of Museums with amazing graduate students and funding from the Mellon New Strategies in the Humanities Program. And we're also working on a project entitled Making Reparation, Writing Revitalization and Creating Reciprocity. We haven't gotten funding for that yet, but chat me if you wanna support it. Thinking about writing and revitalizing and repatriation and reparation, Beth and I also started talking about the Nez Perce writing group that she's a part of and about the unique tradition of cornhusk basket weaving, which you'll hear more about later on. This programming series felt like the perfect opportunity to bring together stories about literal weaving, weaving together multiple languages and the power of language to weave together multiple identities and communities. It's now my pleasure to introduce Beth, Associate Professor of Comparative Literature and Native American Studies here at Berkeley and affiliated faculty in linguistics, theater, dance, and performance studies, the Amer and the American Studies program. Beth is also the chair of the designated emphasis in indigenous language revitalization at Berkeley. She serves on the campus NAGPRA committee, and she does like a million other things on campus. <laughs> She's the author of Domestic Subject, Gender, Citizenship, and Law in Native American Literature from Yale University Press, and most recently, the acclaimed mixed genre collection the Beadworker Stories, which was published by Counterpoint Press in 2019. This book features a version of Antigone that Beth also wrote and mounted at the Hearst back in November of 2018 with actually some of the people here today. I was remembering that tightly packed audience in the museum gallery and it feels like a lifetime ago, but I'm so thankful to you, Beth, and to all of you for being here with us now virtually. So now I'll turn it over to you, Beth. Hatlach oikalo, li loitzich kia pi amtsich ki lehein. Good afternoon, everyone. We're happy to be gathering together today. Katsuyao, Katie Fleming, Lauren Kreutz, Ka Hearst Museum, Sepes Lausa Kuxwepe, Berkeley Pe, for hosting this pi amtkin ka nimi punim titemanawet for sharing your words with us today. When Akisa Beth Piatot, Ka In West, Mimi Pu. I am Beth Piatot and I am Nez Perce from the Wallawa Band. Today it is a great honor to emcee this program of readings and reflections by Mimi Pu Nim Titimanawet, 
Nez Perce writers. Nun Wisich Nimipu. All of us presenting today are Nimipu, Nez Perce. Most of us are the members of a Nez Perce Creative Writers Group that meets every Friday online. The seven of us live in Lapway, Idaho, Spokane, Washington, Tucson, Arizona, Berkeley and Davis, California, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to support writing in Nimiputimt as a method of language revitalization. We are all language learners and teachers at different levels, and our method is to lead with the heart, to lead with creativity. We turn to the words and statements that our elders and ancestors have provided for us, and we weave their words into our own creative visions. In this way, the language becomes truly our own to live and to thrive. We are gathering around corn husk bags today. We are gathering to weave our words with our ancestors, to remember the work and the lives of our ancestors, to remember all our relatives, dogbane and corn husk, and all living beings who connect us to our homelands and hold our roots. Pi amtsich is a word with three parts, reciprocal prefix, gathering verb, plural, present, suffix. It is poetry itself. Pi amtsich. We are gathering We are speaking our people's language. Our writings are like corn husk bags made for gathering, woven to hold our words and our roots and our futures. Our first reader today is Kevin Peters, a ranger interpreter at the Nez Perce National Historical Park and a retired international ranger with Parks Canada. A graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts, Kevin is an artist, a flautist, and a movie extra. He will be joining us by phone to read his meditation picture bags. Kevin? Hello. How are you today? I'll be reading my uh, piece here. Uh, it is called Picture Bags, and uh, it was inspired by literally a walk through our museum looking at our bags that we have in uh, Nez Perce National Historical Park. And for a moment, I looked at them and they were just bags. And then I realized they're a little bit more than that. And then I started thinking. And at some point after that, I wrote this. I was inspired. So this is my writing here, picture bags. I've smiled very much as I looked at these creative works. I looked at the beaded visions and thought, yeah, we are. And what we are is humanity. I took time and let the visions sink into my spirit and shine out again and leave me. Leave me with an impression marked upon my heart and I am glad. The tradition of art has been in progress since Coyote told the world we were coming this way in the deep canyons and the rock grim rivers, we created art told of our lives and all that they encompassed from birth to death in the continuous circle of life. By color and light and motion, we live in our world and it is good. In the rising of the sun, we sing. The path is revealed once more, and we must go on. This is the way it has been. And with perseverance and hope and faith, we will continue. When I looked at these picture bags individually, I thought how still and how quiet they were. Then I thought back into what it meant to be alive. I had to look beyond just a picture bag and think, who made it? Who were they? And why? It was then that the, ba the bags began to speak to me and say, you know us, think. It was then I said, yes, I know you and all your cousins. 
I've seen you carried with pride and joy at Northwest celebrations. Was it with a young girl looking for quietness and grace? Or was it with the elder lady who had attained these attributes and smiled at the child, knowing that one day the child too would attain them and have memories of her own? Maybe it was when I saw you downtown with a gray braided hair grandmother. She wore an old long dress cut in the old way. She had on rubber galoshes over her moccasined feet. Her rose pattern bandana she wore around her head had come untucked and flapped in the afternoon breeze. But her picture bag purse remained true to her hand and only waved slightly in the breeze. The hot sunny day, a dusty powwow is long behind me and the gray haired grandmother has long since shuffled down the autumn street, but I remember them. The symbols on the bags and purses, containers come from life and all that surrounds us, the old moon and star, roses wild and otherwise, lucky horseshoes, someone else's power charm of good fortune, now put into the almost three-dimensional art form of flat beadwork. 1944, another war mother, another star, crossed flags, red, white, and blue, and a blue hand. Stories come to mind. People I need to talk to. Who was he? Where were we going then? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Our next speaker today is Jenny Williams, who's provided a short video for us. Jenny is a teacher at Lapway High School and a weaver of cornhusk bags, and she'll be sharing her knowledge of the materials and her love for the tradition of weaving. Miss Jenny Williams. I've lived all my life on the Nez Perce Reservation, all 70 years. I fell in love with corn husk weaving and the fine work, the beautiful designs. I began weaving on my own from looking at corn husk bags. There was much more to learn, and I was fortunate to learn more techniques from Joey Lavador about 25 years ago. I love to weave small earrings and larger bags. I have made a few hats. I am currently working on a hat row of my apprentice, working slowly on hers. I want to talk about what's going on right now back to making the twine that the Plateau people originally use. The first slides are showing the process of dog bane. And the next slide is showing how I was using the dog bane as the warp and the weft. The dark color in the hemp was made from burying it in mud to make a dark color. The bags are also show the hemp at the bottom of the bag. It is, I would also like to show you the different colors by using the natural dyes. The reds are the huckleberry, the elderberry, and the chokecherry. The orange is from using bloodroot. It makes a bright orange, and then I continue to use it over and over until the, to get the lighter oranges. The yellow is made from an alder bark. I usually use walnut to make the brown colors but the slides are showing, the next slide is showing the commercial dyes. As you see in the museums are made from this plant. The warp is also, the warp is made from twine dog bane, which is made up of hemp. And in the very old bags, the warp and the weft are made from the hemp. Corn husk was introduced later and adding the weft 
which is called false embroidery. This is because the corn husk never passes behind the warp. Only the ends appear inside of the bag. I believe the beauty of this corn husk designs are not grafted out, but the ladies relied on their artistic sense of color and pattern. We may not understand all the designs, but many tell their stories. Later yarn was introduced to make the bright designs. I personally prefer using corn husk only. I like to use a combination of natural dyes and the commercial dyes. I want to thank Beth for this opportunity to talk about corn husk and the opportunity to be with such an elite group of people. So thank you very much and I hope the rest goes well for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for preparing such a beautiful uh, message for us. The remaining pre presenters tonight are the members of the Nimipunim Titimanawet, Nez Perce Writers Group. First up is Philip E. Kashkash, who's Cayuse and Nez Perce, and originally from Northeastern Oregon. He holds a double doctorate in linguistics and anthropology from the University of Arizona. He's a published poet, artist, and internationally recognized scholar. Phil will be reading Kekhefe, poem for the one who made the corn husk bag. Thank you. This poem is actually part translation of a museum label for a major art institution back east. And I translated this first part for the museum. And the second part will be my new edition. Part one. Nimipu titokama hipti pau ya nika imitpa ki tats han yin himakas itatas. This large flat bag was made as a storage container for food. Ki itatas kunko hihyanihna kamawa titokama hipauskaena konika na chochna hana katkianihna hu konika ka mina hipaknia nihna ka kushtita kawa. Bags like this were especially useful for seasonal moves to river fishing camps, root gathering fields, and winter villages. Nimipu ayatma kamu hinakamksina hipayamka kakawa hipahinakia tuhetki. Women created these bags from the peeled, cured, and hand-spun fibers of dog bean, which naturally repels insects or silkweed. He can we sina tiltlau tima palkaipa itadaspa. Kustita tiltlau timanin he we sap hutsa ko cha. They decorated them with geometric designs that were different on each side using contrasting color plant fibers such as corn husks. Kots soyapo hipanapaika tahe ilpos ka chapatam ta kikt kimet kuskinik. Nimipunim kaniwia watu nim koch hipania kimti kaniwit kiwana kin ka kapa. As Euro American materials like wool, yarn, and chemical dyes came into the region, artists incorporated them into many, many bags. 
part two, sister. Nana, sister, what im alanwishna pitu kala nawatna kakawa chapnim hipat shauka tachpaem pa? Did you flee so? from the soldiers when the bullets echoed between the hills. Im a chaya kaka piwapshia nakia. You were absent when the war ended. Matu kona imim petu petuna awiusha. But among the various things you had there, awiakcha imim I find your finished twine bag. Hikala kinich inim waswako. This is all I have now. Nana, sister. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Good to see you out there. Our next Timanawet is Inez Hernandez Avila, who is Nez Perce and Tahana and Professor of Native American Studies at UC Davis. She works to create hemispheric connections between indigenous writers in the Americas. You will hear her weaving those connections in her poem, Song for My Grandmothers. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I wanted in this poem to weave the languages um, that um, I work with. And two of them are the colonial languages that I grew up with, English and Spanish. And then the Nimibu language, which is the one that is dearest to me. <clears throat> Song for my grandmothers. Cecilia and Alice Moisa, who rooted me and dreamt me into being. One, Cecilia, mi mama Cecilia. Si pus huelete, tears <laughs> on my face. La tristeza, right. la tristeza que tengo dentro está para explotar. The sadness I have inside me wants to erupt. I feel you in my being. The pain, the dolor that must have coursed through you when your husband, I will not call him my great grandfather, left you at home. Dark beauty, Indian beauty. You were set aside when your husband went out on the town with his light skinned mestiza dressed to the teeth. She was the one he had on his arm as he strolled around the plaza. She was the one who received the gifts he purchased for her. She was the one he wanted to be seen and seen with. My own father had to be his boy on those occasions, had to walk around with him to carry his compras. Tears are running down my face. La tristeza que tengo dentro está para explotar. The sadness I have inside me wants to erupt. Slender beauty, pura India. I will never forgive your husband for what he did to you. But I will say this, Mama Cecilia, in the one photo I have, I see in your face, in your eyes, in your stance, what became my Papa Sabas, your son, my grandfather, what became my father, your grandson. I see love, un amor puro, a fierce, tender love that you gave them. Un amor consciente, atento, fino, lleno de gracia, a conscious, attentive, fine love full of grace. My father always spoke of you in almost a whisper. Such was his love for you as a woman sacred. My papa Savas, your son, transmitted your beauty in his very being, in his quiet walk, 
his delicately strong carpenter's hands in his radiant smile, in his reverence for me, his granddaughter, Nimi Bu and Mexicana, in the way he saw and loved my Nimi Bu mom, another Pura India. I, Mama Cecilia, I am so touched by you because of you I came to be. Two. Alice Moisa, Grandma, Pique of my Pique, Iskala Laita, an eagle is soaring around for you to let us know you are with us. You come to me in dreams. I always see you in purples with your braids, your headscarves, and your jewelry. Your colors become me, Grandma. For you, Ilelim Wet. So, I am singing as I dance. I know you are waiting for me. I know you will be the first in line to receive me when I cross. I see you in my face, Grandma Alice Moisa. Mana et kekotsa, wet ik ao. Oh, Grandmother, are you also going to dance? I see you smiling. Happy to know that step by slow, careful step, Thimske, in bits and pieces, I'm weaving our language with my heart. Inim Thimmene. Thank you. Katsi, yeah, Inez, beautiful. Continuing our words of connection, Julian Ankney of Lapway reads next. Julian is a graduate of Lewis Clark State College and Washington State University and currently teaches English and creative writing at WSU Pullman and WSUV Vancouver. She has co-taught with other language experts a pilot class at WSU that focuses on language reclamation, revitalization, and the importance of Nez Perce language and culture. Her work includes creating a space for language reclamation as resistance through the digital platform Twine2. Julian is the 2020 recipient of the WSU Associate Faculty of Women Founders Award. She'll be reading, I Weave for You, I Weave for Me. Beth, Oikolo. Thank you all for coming. Enam Timina Was Ace My heart is happy. Um, and this poem is for all of the missing and murdered Indigenous people. I weave for you, I weave for me. I weave for you, I weave for me, ka'ap, the sound of hitting, a man with a club, pow kapow, taking coup, or the sound of biting teeth, made of steel. They come in dreams and spike the punch of a thousand generations of Indians. She tilts her head in wonderment. Listen. How can life live so long like this? Look around, the Niti Tulwit are coming. Our ancestors and their ancestors and my brother who went missing three years ago for all the brothers who are Aztec, for all the animals and all the creation stories, owls and frogs and bees and bears, everyone's coyote story. I weave for you, I weave for me. Ta -la, la 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 The way something tumbles, da tumbles downwards like an eagle that was shot. Flashbacks of a woman running her back towards burning teepees glowing embers swirling like grass reaching for the stars she is running carrying her child she is seen from behind a scope le cat sound of echo of noise or voice 
Distantly, a man is standing in the doorway with a shotgun. Her mind remembers her ancestors, Sand Creek, Wounded Knee, White Bird, Big Hole, Bear Paw. Trails of tears stream down a mother's face, another vanishing Indian. These American ghosts, these bead workers and weavers of story, I weave for you, I weave for me. Pit pilu, pit pilu, the owls cry. The day I knew he was gone, owls came to me, nesting in my backyard, calling to me from the trees. We are the roots in these lands. We are tied to the sounds she makes. The notes of our ancestors rising like prayer. And she sings, Yahahia, Yahahia, oh. An emotional and nostalgic interjection. The cries of a thousand mothers and fathers. Yoch, 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 yoch and the sound of the bones of a thousand sons and daughters hitting against each other, turning to dust. Our creation to feed the earth with the bones of our missing. I weave for you, I weave for me. Ancestors are our story. Actions as methodology, stories as theory, Plants our hair, trees our lungs, earth our skin, water our blood. Medicine is earth systems intertwined in reciprocity, in spirit. Through the language we live, we weave. Through the stories we live, we weave. We are growing stronger even still, and we weave. Look into my eyes. We are the medicine. I weave for me. I weave for you. Yoch kolo. Thank you. Cat yao yao. Thank you, Julian. Cat yao. Our next Tim and Noet is Kellen Lewis a visual artist, performer, and small business owner who embraces his identities as both a member of the Nez Perce tribe and a man of African-American descent. He owns and operates Chanal Original, a small visual arts business aimed at increasing underserved communities' visibility in contemporary culture. Kellen will be reading In West Mimipu, I am Nez Perce. Thank you, everyone. Four points of interest. One, the Wallawa Band of Nimipu and or Nez Perce people were forcibly removed by the United States federal government from their ancestral lands near Wallawa Lake in the Wallawa Valley of Northeastern Oregon onto a significantly reduced reservation in the Idaho Territory. To maintain their freedom, many different Nimipu made a 1200 mile flight seeking asylum in Canada, suffering many battles and casualties along the way. Fort Fizzle was a temporary military barricade erected by the US Army and civilians in July of 1877. Its purpose was to intercept the Nez Perce in their flight to freedom from North Central Idaho over the Lolo Pass into the Bitterroot Valley of Western Montana. The name describes the effectiveness of the fort as the Nimipu and or Nez Perce people were able to distract the soldiers at the fort with a diversion so that the women and children could double back and get past the barricade without confrontation. Shortly before daybreak on August 9th of 1877, the US Army and civilian vol volunteers attacked a sleeping village of Nez Perce people on their flight to freedom. The order was to shoot low in the tents thus affecting fatal strikes on the unsuspecting families deep in their slumber. 
The word must die means cheek or face in Nimiputemt, Ness Purse language. With that, I give you In Was Nimipu, I am Ness Purse, or I am the people. In Was Nimipu, In Was Isi, who are you? N N I N G through my veins is a mighty legacy rolled through tragedy, ripped from the lake a sea of beings fleeing, freeing themselves with superior strategy. I watch your fort fizzle. Flip and double back, I ask again, Isiwas, tell me what you claim. We've seen game arranged, a brutal campaign that remains the same, a lame attempt to tame the true me, contain my inner beauty, feign to do me the favor of replacing the source from whence I came as if it's your duty. And still I know my name, the flame flows through me. The frustration pains me, explain the way there's more to gain when we attain an understanding, sane and non-demanding to say, to stay in one's lane, stop commanding. Yet the inane stories you maintain, playing rodeo cowboy, clutching tightly the horse's mane. You seek the fame free of blame. You speak not of how you maim innocence. Aim low in the tense. A true image never placed in their frame. Please, a moment of silence. In was nimipu. Im was isi. Who are you looking for a resolution? You won't find it here. Wa tu he was kina. You can find it mina. Try looking in the treaties and treatises that taught you to treat me and treat us as if we are nothing. Relics of the past, past and now a goner, a past you do not honor. American history passing on her lies, though flailing in her eyes, she's failing to realize we are sailing to brighter skies. Running through the clouds, running through our veins, running down my cheek, the tear ponders. Must I ask you again? You are who? In was nimipu. Katsi out yo, Kellen. In our writings, we've been showing our deep interconnections to our homelands, ancestors, arts, and each other. We ourselves are woven. In the poem that I will read, I write to my daughter, Twyla whose name of English origin means woven of two threads or doubly woven. This poem is a companion piece to another that I won't be reading today about a community in mourning over a lost child. The title of this piece is Hinka Ista, which is a Nez Perce term of endearment that means dear child or cherished child. Hinka Ista for Twyla. You named yourself before you were born. Your name came to both of us on the same day. And on the day you were born, a rose bloomed in a faraway garden. Your essence precedes you. When you were a baby, even strangers would say, what an old soul. And at the long house, the old ladies cooed, he yo ha molitz, and how gold, how gold. In the longhouse, your uncle said, beautiful Nez Perce baby, you must remember this, Hinka Ista. You are a beautiful child, beloved, born to us, born for us, born to lead, to dream, to carry. You are made of your ancestors. You are made of this land. You are doubly woven, child of root and cloud. Katsia, yeah. 
Our next Timinawet is Angel Sabota, Nimipu from Lapway, Idaho. Angel works for the Nez Perce Language Program and is currently completing her PhD at the University of Idaho. Her dissertation research focuses on indigenous knowledge in language, stories, and land. She will be sharing her meditation, Kekepe Kenniwet, Corn Husk Weaving, weaving our corn husk bags and stories together. Okay, I'm unmuted. All right. So I want to begin um, by pushing, the, show, sharing this. Um, <laughs> you know, it goes in and out. Uh, let me see here. First time I'm doing this background and there's something blocking here. I don't know why I can't get, okay. Um, <laughs> it's like a ghost. I, can, I was gonna show this. No, I guess maybe if I could get rid of the background. How can I do this? Can you see it? Kinda, okay. <laughs> this is um, Katza, uh, Rena Catherine Ramsey and myself. She was at the language building doing work. This is what I'm going to be talking about. And I didn't show a picture of her. You can kind of see it, but it's reflecting. I guess that's better. And uh, so I just wanted to give you some context of who I'm talking about, this Sayakat's uh, uh, Ayat, this beautiful lady. And uh, so what I'm going to read to you is a just kind of an explanation. It's not a fancy dancy um, poem. Um, I do have, um, I want to promote a book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I do have a story called, and she sings and she weaves. And I think Katie may have made it available to everybody, but this is um, another story I wrote about my katsa. And I really like this because it's a, this book, it's a accordion book. I just made it, it's an accordion. Uh, but anyhow, my grandma was such an inspiration that she's made me think about her and do things um, for her. At the very end, I'm going to show you some of the pieces that I'm talking about. Uh, my background um, that I chose is actually a, something from the Nez Perce National Historical Park. Um, and I believe it's my grandma's work. It looks like her work. So here I go. Kakapa Kaniwit, corn husk weaven, weaving our corn husk bags and stories together. So this is when I first began and this is it. Okay, Nakots, my maternal grandmother was with Essa. She told us it meant born and reborn. She was also known as Rena Catherine Ramsey. We called her Grandma Catsy or Grandma Catherine. She was a whip, whip woman. After she passed away, my mother Rosa Yura received her whip and became the whip woman and received her mom's name, Witsessa. Katsats taught my sisters, a brother and I, how, how to do yarn bag weaving when we were little. When she tried to teach me how to do kakapa, corn husk weaving, it involved a new different twist. That twist just seemed to only twist my mind. I could not figure it out. So I only worked on yarn bags. Katsat's Katsi passed away in August of 1999. In June of 2000 at her memorial, some of her kakapa corn husk bags were given away to other people. I never owned any of my grandma's kakapa. I was frustrated and hurt. Later, it became a blessing in disguise because what I did receive was my grandma's kakapa starts. This kakapa pictured was one of her starts. The bottom part of the darker corn husk is what my katsats wove and I finished the remainder. Katsats and I wove this our kakapa carries a treasure of stories. When I carry this, I am carrying a piece of katsats with me. 
This kakepa shows the progression of learning to weave kakepa, but it also, but it is also a reflection of my life's experiences. And through a Nimipu worldview, one learns from mistakes and experiential learning. In the beginning, I made mistakes here and there, but I got better. I still have room to improve both in weave and kakapa and in life. To finish this kakapa, I work with expert kakapa weavers, my sister Joyce McFarlane, my nephew Kellen Lewis, Maynard Labrador, and Jenny Williams. They helped me to get that twist that Kotsitz was trying to teach me. I created the design based on the colors and, and design that Kotsitz started. Observing this kakepa closely reveals the flaws in my weaving with some of the string showing. In some expert kakepa weavers bags, the strings are invisible inside and outside. Their bags look perfect. I put a cloth liner in this bag, which hides the imperfections. I started weaving this kakapa in 2004. It took about 45 minutes to weave one row around the bag. If I made a mistake, I ripped it out and fixed it. This kakapa took several years to finish it. This was because I would get busy with other things. Near the top of the kakapa, one can see where my weaving improved. A wonderful thing about a kakapa is seeing the beautiful design on one side, and then when you flip it over, it reveals a surprise with a different beautiful design on the other side. In July 2013, with the Nespers Appaloosa Horse Club, we stopped at Itzkun Salihpa, place of the buffalo calf, also known as Big Home. We did a small ceremony there to bring out and dedicate that the completion of this kakapa in honor of our Katsats, Katsi. Big Hole was a special memorial for her to attend. Her Kalatsats, paternal grandpa, Bototlan, hair combed up over the eyes, fought at Big Hole during the 1877 Nespers flight to freedom. Her namesake and, and grandma, Witsessa, was also there with two of their daughters and a son. One daughter was killed at Big Hole. Now I have something that Nakats and I wove together. It took me from not receiving to receiving a greater blessing. I now have the gift of knowledge of how to do kakapa weaving. And we have a powerful story that intertwines continuing the work of our ancestors both in weaving and in stories. It connects beautiful meaning, relationships, and survivance. And so I'm going to share with you, this is what I'm working on, or that I finished with my grandma. And this bottom part, this bottom part is the darker part that my grandma started. This was one of her starts, like this is one of her starts. This is one of her other starts of another bag. And she has still, I could see the little knots that she has here and there. And it tells a story in itself. It tells me she's going to, this is where she's gonna start a design. This is her roadmap to this. So this is her start and I finished it from here on up. And as I said before, once you turn it around, it's a whole nother beautiful surprise on the other side. And that's what's so neat about this, so special. And this, um, like my grandma's, I believe that's my grandma's um, picture in the background is of her weaving. She wove with corn husk and yarn, and this is corn husk and yarn. And we parade with this and all my flaws that you see here, when I'm on a horse, I'm far away, so you can't see my flaws. <laughs> and over the years, our sick of our horses have chomped into it. They've torn um, the yarn here and there. And so anyhow, uh, 
or sikkim, they like these bags too. <laughs> and so with the, this, this is a start. This is one of her starts. You know, we all have these starts and things in our projects where we start them and we put them to aside and pick them up later. And so I am going to continue this legacy with my daughters where they have begun, got, begun to work with yarn and they'll pick up my grandma's starts and finish it and they'll have a piece of her with them as well. Yo, kalo. That's all. And now we come to the final piece in our presentation today. Sending us off today will be Sarah Christine Hennessy, a poet and performer residing in southeastern Pennsylvania. She has three poems forthcoming in Yellow Medicine Review, Paper Dragon, and Pork Belly Press and often incorporates elements of her Nimipu heritage, both culturally and linguistically in her work. Sarah will be reading Ken Wiese. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is such a beautiful, beautiful event. Um, the piece that I'm going to share with you is based off of um, I learned to weave when I was in college. I took a Nez Perce language class, uh, a bunch of them actually. <laughs> and um, our elders were part of the, the teaching team for that class and they taught us how to weave. And so years later um, in a poetry project, I started writing this piece and it's entitled Kentwisa, which means I am weaving. And I use a word we've used a lot tonight, uh, over and over, and that means thank you. And then I use some other Nimi Putimt, some other Nez Perce language, um, and it's always followed by the word that it means. So without further ado, my piece, Kent Wiesa. Kutsiyautyautitakas, elders, I am weaving, and though my fingers know the way, and though the yarn rubs raw, one small patch on my knuckle, I am weaving. Cuts it yao yao ipsus, fingers. I am weaving in the old way. And though I change out and change in each color chosen with care. And though the yarn rubs raw one small patch on my fingertip. And though my eyes are weary. And though the jute rubs raw one small patch by my fingernail. I am weaving. Cuts it yao yao silu eyes. I am weaving in the old way. Can we sa? I am weaving. I am doing as my elders taught me. I am moving as I'm taught and I'm teaching as I'm moving. I am weaving. Cuts it yao yao sepahitamanat wat. Teachers. Can we sa? I am weaving with color and care. Cuts it yao yao joanne fabrics and crafts. Can we sa? I am weaving with purpose, and I am weaving, though raw or weary, because these nimble fingers have love for the dexterity others lose, and have love for dexterity others have not yet developed. And so I weave. Katsit yao yao nakats, my grandma. Ka katsit yao yao mamayets, children. Can we sa? I am weaving with patience and when frustrated, while quiet and while roaring with laughter. Can we sa? I am weaving with my family, even when I am alone. Kutz yao yao oi klo himiyuma, all my relations. Yoklo, that is all. Yoklo. <laughs> Uh, um, this is the end of our program for today. Um, I would just ask um, all of our Timanawet to unmute yourselves and say one last katsuyao. Thank you everyone for coming and spending this afternoon with us today and especially to Angel for having a happy day. Thank you um, to our hosts and everyone. Katsuyao. Uh, Hachiao, oi,
starts at Kapa and it's Gedi Kame. Tots kalau at Oikolo. Good evening. Tots yao yao Oikolo. Happy birthday. And she said special day because my daughter brought me roses for my birthday. So if you wondered why she said that, <laughs> why she singled out me. <laughs> yeah.